This is the beginning of our Unit 5 on plant physiology. And the first chapter that we're looking at is focusing on angiosperm or flowering plant reproduction, which is the major portion of any organism's physiology, is how is it going to have successful reproduction. So in terms of plant behavior, we don't really think of plants as having behavior, but in a sense, they do. They have relationships with other organisms. So in this example, we can see that one of those relationships. And in this case, it's not a mutualistic one because this flower, this Ophrys flower, has evolved, you can see here, to look t t like a female longhorn bee. Um, at least to the male longhorn bee, it looks like a female. And so by having this type of structure, Th this flower is able to take advantage of the male longhorn bee in terms of bringing pollen from a geographically distant member of the Ophrys flower species. And so these insects help these angiosperms reproduce sexually and have diverse genetics by getting and enticing them to come from a distance. These are examples of angiosperms or flowering plants. So any plant that flowers, even an oak tree in as widespread as grasses, anything that produces a flower is considered an angiosperm and they all share the same reproductive life cycle. So your reading is consisting of chapter 38 and only the first section, but within that first section there is a lot of material. So we're going to go through it here. The key features of the angiosperm life cycle are boiled down to these three things, flowers, double fertilization, and then a fruit period. And that plant life cycle is broken down into two alternate generations. We have the sporophyte generation, which is when the spores are produced, and then we have the gametophyte generation where the gametes are produced. And in angiosperms, the sporophyte is the plant that we see, and it's also the dominant generation. It's the one that's the long-lived generation. Um, so the sporophyte is, typically if we think of plants, what we're thinking of is the sporophyte generation. But within the plant itself, there is a second generation that occurs, and that's the gametophyte generation. And it's less conspicuous, it's on a much smaller scale, but it is equally, if not even more important, to the life cycle of the plant. So plant and animal life cycles have quite a bit in common in reality, and surprisingly, the plant is the more complicated life cycle. But what they have in common is that both animal and plant individuals go an, or alternate between a diploid and a haploid phase. So with an animal, we go from diploid, and again, just a reminder, diploid means there are two sets of chromosomes in every cell, except for gamete cells. And those two sets of chromosomes have come from two parents, both the male and the female parent. So that's the same for an animal as it is for a plant. If that plant was reproduced sexually, it will have two sets of chromosomes from a mother and a father, or two individual plants, not necessarily um, gendered, but two different plants um, producing a diploid cell. Um, if the plant produces or reproduces asexually, it will still be diploid but it will have two sets of identical chromosomes. So when we have something diploid, when the cell is diploid, we represent that as 2N. And when we have only one set of chromosomes, we represent that as 1N, and we call that a haploid cell. So both animals and plants go from diploid to haploid through the process of meiosis. You can see here is meiosis and here is meiosis. 
But in a plant, that meiosis is just phase one of the process of getting to the haploid stage. It also will go through mitosis. So there's an in-between stage in a plant between the diploid sporophyte and the haploid gametophyte, and that's the spore phase. So through meiosis, we go to haploid, <coughs> and we get spores. Those spores will reproduce to make a multicellular gametophyte, but each of those cells is only one N. It is haploid. <coughs> Whereas it, with an animal, we go through meiosis, and we just go directly into having a unicellular haploid gamete, either a sperm or an egg. So once we have our haploid gamete or gametophyte, then we can eventually end up with fertilization occurring. So with an animal, that would be our next step. So we have two haploid gametes joined together. We, that's called fertilization. And then the growth of the individual occurs through mitosis until we reach a full multicellular individual who's back to that 2N stage. And that 2N stage really began at fertilization. <coughs> but with a plant, we also have another midway step between fertilization and our gametophyte. So here we have our gametophyte that's 1N but it still has to go through mitosis in order to produce the actual gametes. And then, after we have gametes, then we can have fertilization, and then the same process where we have a, now a 2N individual, this being the sporophyte, that goes through mitosis to produce the large, um, fully grown sporophyte. The alteration of alternation of generations is the one between the sporophyte and the gametophyte, and you can see it represented here as this pink is the gametophyte and the clear white is the sporophyte. This is another picture, um, representation of the same thing here. But what I wanted to point out with this slide is that their flowering plants have the equivalent to the sperm and the egg. And in a flowering plant, the sperm is the pollen, and the egg is the gametophyte, which is within the ovary. Now, on to flower structure and the function and how they relate. So flowers are the reproductive shoots of an angiosperm's sporophyte, and they attach to a part of the stem called the receptacle. And the flower consists of four floral organs. It will have carpels, stamens, petals, and sepals. Stamens and carpels are reproductive organs, whereas the sepals and petals are sterile. And they also have a function, but it's not related to reproduction. <coughs> we say a flower is complete if it has all four of these basic floral organs. And we call a flower incomplete if it lacks at least one of those organs. So here's a diagram showing the different portions and structures of a flower. So you can see here, this is the shoot from the sporophyte, and where it's attaching to the flower is the receptacle. And then if we go from the outside of the flower in, we see here is the sepal, which s actually serves the purpose of being a protective coating for the flower as it's developing. So it, if you, you, we've all f been seeing flowers that are closed up, and usually these outer portions that are the protective, little bit tougher petals are the sepals or sepals. 
And then the next portion in is the petal, which is often the colorful portion of the flower. And its purpose is to attract a pollinator. So that's the reason we have the evolution of so many beautiful colors and distinct patterns as a way to attract different pollinators. Then the next layer in is going to be our stamen, which consists of the anther and the filament. And then the very center of the flower is going to be the carpal, which consists of a stigma, style, and ovary. So these are pictures of showing all the different forms that a flower can take. You can see the huge variety. Um, this is another look at the four rings of the structure of a flower. So if we look at this as these rings from the outside to the inside of the flower, we have the outside again being the sepal or sepal, and then the petals, and then the stamens, and then the carpal. So the stamen is what we consider the male portion of the flower. It consists of the anther and the filament, and it's where pollen, which is the male gametophyte, will be found. The carpal <coughs> is the female portion of the flower, and within the ovary here of a carpal is where we're going to find the egg or the female gametophyte. Um, the other portion of the carpal is this stigma, which is the sticky portion at the top, and then the style, which is the long tube connecting the stigma and the ovary. So this is a close-up look <coughs> at a stamen. You can see here the long stalk or the filament, and then the terminal anther, which contains chambers called microsporangia. Um, another word for that is pollen sacs, and there are four pollen sacs in each anther. This is a picture showing the pistil, or the carpal. So a pistil, we use the word pistil to refer to a single carpal, or we can have two or more fused carpals together, and together those are still considered the pistil. <coughs> so a carpal, a single one, will have an ovary at its base and a slender neck called the style, and the top portion, again, being the stigma, which is typically sticky in order to capture pollen. And then within this ovary, you will find one or more ovules. So some flowers have a single carpal, and then others actually will have several carpals fused into a single structure. And then within that, you'll have an ovary with two or more chambers, and each of those ovaries will have one or more ovules. So we have potential for a lot of reproduction within a single flower. Taking a second here, pause this and see how many structures you can identify. And you can go ahead and look back and as a review, but see if you can find the different structures. Okay, did you find the stamen here? There are several stamen. And right there, we have a, a pistil that is consisting of three different carpels. You can still see here the three different tops of carpels that have been fused together to make the one pistil. These green leaves here are actually green petals. These are actually sepals or sepals. And then we have the colorful petals. Right there, you can see a great picture of anthers with pollen located on them. And then this last one has a cross section that's showing an ovary. So we're going to stop here before we go on um, into part two of this lecture.